record. I'm here with Drake Moore on the Industrial Music Project, 40 Octaves Below, as well as the collaborative project, Mesmer's Ghost. How are you, Drake? I'm well, thank you. How are you today? I'm all right. I've had a very busy week. So the first of, so I, I'd like to start by asking, well, first, how are you doing? And secondly, I would like to ask you a, this very, very important question that I think um, the listeners of both my program as well as your musical output would like to know. Um, what is your favorite color and why isn't it purple? Purple is quite nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I tend to be drawn to black. Mm -hmm. um, many will argue that black is not a color, but it is certainly uh, the most appealing uh, in the visual spectrum. Mm -hmm. It's my current incarnation. Yeah, what, what makes you think that? I tend to surround myself by it. It, uh, it brings me comfort. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. One thing that I've come to realize is that uh, light cannot exist without dark. Mm -hmm. So to deny the darkness in ourselves is to uh, deprive us, ourselves of the, the light as well. So uh, darkness is something that uh, I've learned to embrace uh, through my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And it, it's uh, allowed me to uh, embrace that, that lighter side of myself. Thank you. Um, I, some, some comments to add to that. Um, have you seen uh, season one of the HBO TV show, True Detective? I have not. It's, uh, it's basically, it's an eight hour movie and it stars Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrison who plays these two detectives who are investigating a uh, occult related crime in Louisiana. And at the end of the episode, uh, the show, sorry, um, <clears throat> both of them, they looked upon the night sky and I think um, I think uh, Woody Harrison's character said that um, hmm, it seems that the dark is winning, and then McConaughey said that no, um, no, because in the beginning there was only the darkness. If you're asking me, the light is gaining a lot of uh, you know steam or power or space. I'm, I'm of course I'm paraphrasing it here. So. Um, I would like to ask, how did you and James come to meet, and how is BC? James is a very good friend. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a uh, few really, really close, uh, good male friends in my life, and I'm quite, uh, I'm a bit of an introvert and a loner by nature, and uh, I grew up in uh, Peterborough, Ontario, mm -hmm. with, uh, where I spent uh, majority of my younger years growing up and uh, having experiences getting educated and uh, returned to Peterborough uh, about three years ago and uh, connected with James. So it's, uh, it's, it, it's been an, uh, an amazing musical journey with James and I'm, I'm quite a fan of uh, his likeness and the, uh, the music that we've created together has been uh, mm -hmm. yeah. quite a journey. And I look forward to uh, creating much more with James. I can see that. Yep, he's an awesome guy too. And he's been gracious enough to, well, have a convo with me on the show as well as introducing me to you um, and your musical project, which I find quite intriguing. Um, so you send me the a song of uh, your latest uh, record. And... Um, is uh is what I find to be a departure from, not quite a departure, but more a, um a variation, another variation of uh, of uh, your previous work. Um, digital fracture. That's that's the album title, and I wonder if the band Deftones play into your sphere of influence because I find that it it's a lot it's a lot like hearing their two. I think their two best records are. 2000s is White Pony and 2012s is uh, Koino Yokan. And uh, what I, I'm reminded of uh, the, their more subtle approach to, to their own sound in the 2012 release, in which basically correlate back to your own record, 
you you have expressed it to me before that you wanted the new one to be a bit more how should I say uh, accessible if that if is that um, am I correct on that yes I mean the music process um, I feel uncomfortable taking credit for I feel that it's more of a channeling it's been mm -hmm. uh, an iterative uh, process of uh, repetition and refining since about 1996 um, I started out uh, playing in industrial metal band called brothel in 99 uh, <clears throat> and that, that was sort of a short-lived experience and I, I came to a point around 2006 where I felt that uh, I didn't I wanted to be very careful about what I what I had to say and I felt that I didn't have much to say mm. not until um, a few years ago when I I came up with the idea of producing Digital Fracture. And, and it was at that point that I felt that uh, there were some things that I would like to say, and I was ready to say them. So that was a bit of a, an experiment. And I was really coming out of uh, the world of software and more into physical hardware and instruments. And I started out with, uh, a drum machine, Electron Analog Rhythm Mark II, and everything was done within that one device, which in a lot of respects was very limiting. But at the same time, it forced me uh, into an environment that uh, I was able to express uh, more clearly mm -hmm. uh, within those limitations. Of course, in the software world, you have so much um, a wealth of plugins and you can literally get lost in the sea of you know trying to find that uh, that perfect sound and you know subsequently never finishing uh, anything you've started I have hundreds and hundreds of songs that you know started out as something but were never finished and then moving into the hardware realm I, I found that I was now finishing songs it was quite an incredible thing to be uh, to be limited, but at the same time set free. Oh, yeah. So with the new album, <laughs> I've added more hardware, and now uh, in terms of sound palette, I have a lot more um, to work with. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be a little different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I can I can feel the difference there. And and you mentioned before about like how music can be kind of a language to express the what you call it the innermost and the kind of the, the messy stuff that is our psyche and uh, our emotional life which um to be frankly honest despite the wide ranging of language the wide range of language it is insufficient and it reminds me of um it reminds me of one of my favorite songs uh runaway by kanye west I wonder if you've listened to it. No. Uh, so it's uh, it's from his uh, 2010 album, My Beautiful My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, and it started out in the first. It's a nine minute song, so the first six minutes it's uh, you know your typical rap verses and chorus and all that. And there's a lore that says that he came up with his entire verse in uh, after listening to the beat in four and a half minutes. But at the at the end of the six minute mark, with a mix of effects including distortion and auto tune and vocoder and whatnot, he turns his own voice into kind of a guitar solo, and he just hums the the, the melody of the Runaway song. And even though he he's not technically saying anything, I find that it is one of the most moving passages of of modern music and, and it's um and i find that it is uh, a stroke of uh kanye west's uh beautiful dark twisted genius interesting yeah it is um so what would be the things that you want to express in your in your music well 
if anyone who has listened to Digital Fracture, and you know, at this point is very um, sort of small uh, niche market base, but uh, lyrically, I have uh, extracted I uh, references from the music. Mm -hmm. It's all about we, it's a collective. Um, I feel that uh, I really wanted to eliminate any kind of ego from the music. And like I said before, it's, it's very much a channeling um, where I'm sitting down and the music is just coming out. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no real uh, preconceived notion of what something is going to turn into. It's very much just a, it's an enjoyable experience that is done purely for the enjoyment. Oh, yes. And in terms of lyric, um, I, 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 don't, I don't want to push ideas on uh, people. Mm -hmm. You listen to it and you find your own meaning. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, uh, the lyrical content, you know, could be uh, perceived a certain way by one individual and mm -hmm. you know, completely different by another. But I, I think certainly the theme that uh, I feel presently that um, kind of, I think comes through is uh, a call for waking up, a call for uh, thinking for oneself, um, unplugging from the digital media streams. Mm -hmm. These are things I think that are very important uh, for us as human beings, if we're going to move forward uh, with minds of our own. Of course, of course. Um, so you mentioned that you are, you, you, you perceive yourself as a medium for the music. And it's a very, it's an intrigue, it's, for me, it's a very intriguing notion. And, and I like to bring up Kanye West again, because um, he made a song in 2014 called Only One, which is a very, very moving ballad uh, dedicated to his mom. And in interviews, he said that he didn't really even remember the recording process because he felt like that was just his mom talking through him. And oh, uh, Kanye's mother, uh, Donda, she passed away in uh, 2007. And it's a really moving piece of music. And uh, Paul McCartney was featured in it, but he, 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 he's, he appeared as a backup vocal to vocals. And I, I've always been, I've always been intrigued by that notion. And even though I'm sort of like disappointed by the fact that there are a lot of like uh, charlatans out there who pretend that they can speak to the dead by having the dead answer their soul and whatnot. I feel like it, there is a genuinely real process in which you feel like you, you know, consciousness is temporarily out the window and you feel a uh, different spiritual force entering your own body and and at times incredibly beautiful thing, things can be achieved but in other times incredibly malicious things can be achieved like the the legend of the wendigo and all of that yeah in terms of channeling it's it's a i feel a universal energy that i'm tapping into mm -hmm. and during the creative process, it's more about um, letting go and being in the moment mm -hmm. and not having any preconceived notions of um, what it is I'm setting out to create. Oh, yeah. um, so, so it's, it's kind of, um, I guess you could say, uh, I, I would consider it an, an intuitive form of music creation. Mm -hmm. um, the better I get to know my tools, the more I can just move about in the environment and let things happen. Uh, so I, I may you know, hear something and I, I just do it. Um, and it's in the moment and it's not, uh, you know, I'm not setting out to sound like anyone in particular, mm -hmm. but of course, um, music is, is rather the sum of mm -hmm. all of the great music that uh, I've got to enjoy in this incarnation, um, all of that. Um, all the experience, all the, uh, the resonant frequencies that bring that in and cannot help but uh, be driven and influenced by that in the process. And, yeah, and I would like to, I'd like to know about your sphere of influence that plays into your 
artistic and creative process. And I, I don't, it, it, it can, it, it, it includes musicians, yes, but it can also include like, uh, you know, artists of various other mediums such as um, cinema and literature and, you know, the visual arts. So, and like, I, I think I've always thought that even when you, you know, of course you strive to be expressive and you strive to have your own voice being expressed. Um, because there are uh, so much uh, content out there, you cannot help but, you know, try absorbing it in some way or another. And again, the, the point about being a medium and all that, you, you are an, a vehicle for the absor absorption of all the things that you perceive and you mix it in with, you know, your own perspective on it and then out comes, you know, the, the, the product of your creativity. Yes, and I think that's true for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, all of us are kind of, you know, driven and influenced by uh, the things that we consume. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very important point um, with regard to media. Uh, whatever uh, information enters into our eyeballs um, becomes a part of our experience. And without knowing it, um, if we're plugging into media streams that are broadcasting ideas to control our minds consciously or unconsciously, uh, those experiences are becoming a part of us mm -hmm. and they become a basis for the decisions that we make day to day and how we conduct ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I, as a young person, I was very uh, enamored with, uh, you know, movies and popular, popular media. And in the last 10 to 13 years, I've really uh, unplugged from that. Mm -hmm. And I made a conscious effort to uh, just experience reality uh, as it occurs around me. Now, of course, <clears throat> in the musical realm these days, one has to spend a little bit of time on social media, uh, putting themselves out there. But I really try to limit that mm -hmm. as much as possible. Um, it's quite disconcerting what's happening in the world today, particularly through the social media platforms and, and media streams. Mm -hmm. you know, in terms of influence, uh, very, very wide, wide, diverse, you know, range of things have influenced me in my lifetime. You know, I was a, a small boy, you know, it was uh, first Led Zeppelin's uh, immigrant song. There's old uh, eight millimeter footage of me you're rocking out in the, uh, the playpen to uh, the immigrant song. Um, you know, then I came along, Boy George of all people, and I just thought that he was uh, so amazing, uh, just doing, doing his own thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the hell with everybody else. Uh, that was really cool. And uh, soon after, I, I discovered, you know, the hair metal of the 80s. <laughs> I think that really, uh, in a lot of ways, saved my life, and certainly. Oh, wow. I mean, made my father uh, breathe a sigh of relief. He was never too happy that I <laughs> was in the boy George's uh, heavily as I was. But, you know, bands like Wasp, uh, Rat, a Motley Crue, mm -hmm. and ultimately, you know, uh, what I would term real metal, like Metallica came along. Oh, yeah. So, and... It, in terms of literature, um, I'm really drawn to uh, science fiction literature, mm -hmm. which I found <clears throat> of all the, uh, the genres of literature uh, is actually uh, explores more spiritual themes than a lot of other uh, types of literature. So I've really been uh, getting into the old classics like uh, works by P.K. Dick, mm -hmm. Robert A. Heinlein, um, Asimov, H.G. Mm -hmm. uh, Wells is some of my favorites right now. Uh, of course, Margaret Atwood, she's been a huge influence. You know, in the art, art realm, <laughs> definitely uh, Salvador Dali. Oh, yeah. Alex Gray. Yeah, lots, lots of influences across different mediums. Yeah, it's just, um, 
that's awesome because that, I wonder how would how would you measure creativity? Like, um, is there like a parameter in which you can judge people's creativity, or you know? It either grabs for, for myself personally. It either grabs me or it doesn't. You know, if I look at something, I'm or I'm listening to something, and my body is responding in a certain way, like I'm getting tingles, or I'm just like, oh my god, this is so amazing. You know, like not even really thinking about it. I'm just, you know, it's it's that reaction for me in my body that I feel. I see. Uh, I think for me, there are, uh, for me, uh, of course, the antithesis of creativity is, you know, commercialized product and all that. And there's always that um, tension between the um, financial slash industrial side of um, the music world, at least, and the creative side of it, because one, one seeks to control the other. That's definitely that. And the other does not want your control it's um it's kind of a, a really really bad uh, parent child relationship isn't it yeah i think i think that that's certainly um certainly true at some point in time I, I i don't know music today you know being uh created by robots and uh having a, a formula in mind in terms of uh specifically pop music and what is um, considered uh, mainstream, marketable. Mm -hmm. You know, there is so much amazing uh, creative talent out there that does not get seen because it doesn't fit a mold. It's not perceived as marketable. Um, the individuals who are, you know, creating this great art um, are not considered attractive enough mm -hmm. to market. You know, there's all kinds of ugly things that come into play. But at the same time, you know, we live in this time where we can seek them out for ourselves. Um, as creators, we can create web pages for next to nothing. We can promote on social media streams. Um, you know, and it may be true that uh, you know we, we can't reach the audience that we'd like to. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, <clears throat> we are enabled to create and share. And if you're doing it for the love and no other reason, then it's a beautiful thing. Oh yeah, it is. I I wish to mention though, um, what was it I was thinking? It's uh, I find it incredibly staggering that um, so basically uh, the entirety of the what do you call it the top forty radio at least in America at least is being gamed by four or five guys from Sweden, and so if you don't remember, I, I guess I I was born after this time where. There was this boy band war between uh, NSYNC and Backstreet Boys, but then the the person, the 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 person who is responsible for you know much of their biggest hits is the same guy. His name is Max Martin, and he's still working today. Like he, like uh, for every what four or five songs that he created, um, one of them or at least two of them hit the Billboard top 40 chart like that guy is some sort of like diabolical genius for for what i can tell and it is it is and it and i i i reflect on that and i thought wow that the ability to which uh, you know people can tune out and just have whatever pre-packaged um corporate stuff being you know sent into them and be so readily accepting of that it's it's staggering and I wish to mm, reflect on what you've said about social media and whatnot because uh, I don't think um, I don't think the problem are is the product of social media itself even though I've noticed very recently that um, the, the the apps and the software that are quote-unquote free on the Apple then Apple App Store are the ones that are trying to gain your attention the most if you pay for a certain software you wouldn't they wouldn't have those like mechanisms in place that 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 depends on your attention it just sucks away your your attention the same way as um that uh the dementors in the third uh, harry potter book and i think um if if we know how to use social media better if we are 
conscious of you know both his his upsides and downsides i think um and also you know putting guys like zuck and jack into uh, in into accountability i think uh, i think we can we can have we can have um, yeah, a solution to this problem it's the same way as uh, cars really i mean they get us from place a to place b but then they can also run over people yeah i, I think it's uh it's a common view the individual human that uh somehow being aware um they can be immune to programming and implanting of information mm -hmm. and uh I, I simply don't think that that's true mm -hmm. um, you listen to um you go back to some of the uh, ideas of timothy leary okay. he has a, a really really uh, enlightening video entitled how to operate your brain which is quite a psychedelic experience but uh it's, it's quite an eye-opener at the same time I don't think anyone is uh, immune to influence, mm -hmm. particularly when that information is entering in through the eyeballs. Uh, the, the human body, I don't, I don't think it is readily, readily able to discern between uh, what is real and what is you know, a video uh, image playing on the screen. Mm -hmm. There are subliminal programs that uh, become a part of you. And uh, I know I'm certainly not immune to that. To that influence in uh, in terms of uh, social media I think one of the most uh, concerning things happening today is the censorship oh yes you know the, the bias censorship that is happening yeah, I know. Uh, to control how people think mm -hmm. and uh, you know we just had a day of remembrance a few days ago <laughs> Yes, I can remember that. I right. remembering uh, people that fought and gave their lives mm -hmm. for uh, our, our fundamental freedoms, you know, in full remembrance of that mm -hmm. and reflecting on current events, you can see that uh, we're surrendering those things that those people died for one by one because of fear. That's correct. Largely implanted through the these media streams mm -hmm. are very, very concerning. Of course, um, um, I, I don't think we, I don't think any one of us um, uh, should be, what do you call it, arrogant enough to assume that we, um, if uh, we can free ourselves from thought control by, you know, just be an individual because, um, so there's this, there's this really small book by Sam Harris known as, called Free Will and it's a really short text. It's only like 10,000 words long. And it debunks the entire notion of what we think of as free will. But then he says that mm, because, we, because we are governed by forces that are entirely um, out of our consciousness, it's, a, it's a imperative. I think we can be more aware of that as well as being more compassionate to those who have done bad things, even though we can all how, how hold them in accountability because they did bad things, but uh, um, but they do it be not really because they are consciously aware of their actions, not completely all the time, but perhaps there's a defect in their neurophysiology. And well, they can always be disputed that book, but. It, it's really worth um, it's really worth checking out. Um, but and I I'm also reminded of um, have you read the comic book out? Uh, I shouldn't say comic book, but graphic novel Watchmen. Oh yes. Oh yes. Um, so there are a lot of characters in there that I find. I mean, I don't really like any of them. I I, I find um, all of them intriguing and complex. And one of them is um, Doctor Manhattan. And there was this, uh, there's this scene, or if you call it, where um, he sends uh, the girl Sally, or no, not Sally, uh, the 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 Sil Specter number two woman onto Mars. And he told her that yes, I can perceive space and time, I can perceive the past and the future and all that, but I cannot change it. 
So, so Spectre number two asks him, well, so you're just a puppet then? And Dr. Manhattan responds with, yeah, but I'm the one that can see the strings. Yeah, I, I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, I, it's, it's uh, something that I've pondered a lot over the years, you know, this, this concept of free will mm -hmm. and whether we actually have any. And, uh, you know, the human within wants to believe that uh, I'm capable of discerning and, you know, making, making my own decisions. Um, but I, I think, you know, we are the sum of all of our experiences. Mm -hmm. and everything that happened to us in our lives um, has an influence on every decision that we make. I think every, every decision, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, the beautiful thing about uh, Dr. Manhattan is he was just in so much uh, acceptance of that, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I, I can be in a state of looking at it and feel angry. Mm -hmm. um, feel frustrated. It helps me understand my fellow human beings yeah. and have compassion for them today and what's happening. Mm -hmm. I can have compassion for you know, all kinds of things, um, no matter how much they deviate from my own set of morals and conduct. I think ultimately, uh, you know, good and bad is kind of an illusion. Mm -hmm. We're just, we're just moving through time. And these things are just unfolding. You know, I'm not entirely uh, convinced that past, present, and future are not the same thing. That this, this whole reality is uh, an illusion to some extent. Mm -hmm. So where a, a lot of people are living in fear today, um, I'm striving very, very hard to just enjoy my time. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been given tools that I can express myself creatively. And I remind myself on a daily basis that isn't this an incredible time to be alive? Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> no, I mean, you look back in history, a recorded history at least, mm -hmm. and uh, what a time this is. Oh, yes. yes Holy yes. crap. <laughs> That's definitely the case, and it's it's um it's a very funny notion to me, and it's a rather understandable notion. Yes, that if you if you was it if you desire like um if you desire a mechanism in which to take you out of reality, there's always things to to there's always something to to do it because um. There, you know, uh, you know all the all the controlled substances out there. Yes, but you know, uh, social media is a drug, and like you said, fear is a drug, and and of course, you know, it. Uh, of course, the opioid crisis is incredibly devastating, but those two elements that I mentioned have way worse effects on human beings, and it's quite concerning to me because. Um, you mentioned that um, there's a thing called darkness, and you know Nietzsche, that guy has this uh, quote about like how you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes back to you. Um, I wonder what do you do about that? Because I have a way in which uh, I, I accept that there's such a thing as darkness, and I tend to I tend to you I tend to what you call it, deal with it by by humor, and if I can, screw in a light bulb. Uh, but um, I think it would be a good closer if uh, I just hand it out to you. And and a good question would be, how do you? Is there a different option to the drugs, the the, the those mechanisms that lead people into pretending that there is a darkness or to numb themselves from it? Is there a way in which you can confront it? You can look it into the eye and say, I am not afraid of you. And in fact, I kind of like you sometimes. That's an interesting question that you, you're asking. Um, I have uh, very strong feelings about the, uh, what I perceive as the war on uh, people, uh, whoever, mm -hmm. you know, whomever is responsible, the perceived undesirables and elimination thereof. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, uncontrolled substances were um, a big part of my life for a long time, um, fueled by rage and self-destruction. Um, there was one particular that I kept returning to uh, over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. and each time I was having an extremely, extremely bad trip. Mm -hmm. And each time I went there, I kind of knew I was going back again and again and again. And it was like uh, just really going into the pits of hell, facing my worst demons, like being swallowed up and disappearing. Uh, just an absolute hopeless, hopeless um, despair. And I, like I said, I kept going back to it. I kept going back to it. It was almost like insanity. And what happened one day, the last time that I went back, I had a realization that this was my fear. My fear was a manifestation of my thoughts. And I can control my thoughts. And in that moment, I said to myself, you have the power to create your own reality. There is nothing to fear here. All of this, this hell, this, this demonic presence that wants to consume you is your own creation. And I, I sent it away. Yeah, um, it's never returned. And ultimately, uh, you know, it was my fear of death. Oh, yeah. That I've concluded years and years later. And it was amplified, absolutely amplified um, through the assistance of this substance. So I think on a daily basis, um, our fear, it, it is something that is, um, it's a thought, it's a feeling, it's something that we can change. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. It's not as easy as that. You know? But I think um, as human beings, we can recognize what feeds our fears and unplug from those things. We can take control over the inputs that come into our bodies and feed our brains, feed our manias, minimize those things, and instead turn to things that make us feel good. Oh, yeah. If there are demons from the past so i had many demons from my past i had to look at those i had to confront them i had to forgive them i had to have compassion for them by looking at what made them the demons that they were mm -hmm. and then realizing that i've been that demon myself mm -hmm. and i've realized that that is not my way that is not the way to be and through that, I have changed. So I recognize the ability in others to change. So I think it all comes down to being impeccable with yourself, taking accountability, um, not only for your actions, but what you choose to consume, whether that be uh, literal or visual or auditory, um, all of those input, inputs. I believe influence influence us on a very very deep level, whether we want to admit it or not. Yeah. Um, one thing I've uh, I've been recently saying to myself when I'm you know, what I call it, surrounded by demons is, uh, well, there's plenty of hellfire to go around. Let's make a barbecue. And with that, <laughs> with that bombshell, drink more, everyone. On forty octaves below. Thank you for joining the show. Thanks, Joe. Pleasure to be here.